Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be talking about civil rights and how that's different from civil liberties. We're going to talk about the civil rights movement. Now, there are many different movements that we could have talked about. Women's suffrage, we could have talked about the LGBT rights movement, but we're going to focus on the uh, civil rights movement mainly because it epitomizes the strategy that's been used by almost all later civil rights movements. And just, you know, there's not enough time to talk about all of the different rights movements that, have, that we've seen over the years. So, first of all, some background. When we talk about civil liberties and political science, this, this is not the same as civil rights. As we talked about last week, liberties refers to freedoms in the Bill of Rights and other parts of the Constitution. When we talk about civil rights, however, we're talking about laws against discrimination. Uh, and all of these are based on the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. So there is a deeply ingrained American value of equality, the notion that all men and women are created equal. And this is as much a political idea as anything. The idea is that your vote is equal to everybody else's vote, which is the basis for majority rule. Majority rule only makes sense if everybody has the same power. So everybody has one vote, everybody has the same voice, and you aggregate that together in a democratic country so that the majority, the will of the majority is what will prevail. There are, in fact, a lot of different types of equality. We're going to talk about three of them. Two of them are going to be very, very important later when we talk about the civil rights movement and the legal strategy. So first is political equality, which is simply that Everybody's vote counts the same. Everybody has an equal uh, chance to vote and has the opportunity to vote, and everybody has an equal voice in government. There's also social equality, which means that everybody has an equal part of society. This was the defining feature of segregation in the South and also elsewhere in the country. Uh, this is what the Civil Rights Movement was struggling to achieve. So it's the idea that everybody can live in any neighborhood they want, everybody can go to any school that they want to, and there's not different opportunities for people. And finally, there's economic equality. We're not going to talk about this in the terms of civil rights, but that simply means equal economic opportunity. Um, some people distinguish between equal outcome and equal opportunity. You know, there's uh, some people believe that income inequality, for instance, is very harmful, and so they care very much about economic equality. So three different types of equality, two of them are going to be very important as we go through the civil rights movement. So just a little more background. When we talk about discrimination, discrimination at its core is basically inequality based on some attribute. And this can take many different forms. Um, a crazy guy with a bullhorn on the side of the road screaming about end times or about you know conspiracy theories about government is not going to be equal in terms of being taken seriously. The obnoxious bore is not going to be treated equally when it comes to invitations to parties and the lazy bum who refuses to work is not going to have as much money as other people. So discrimination again takes many many different forms and it's considered bad when it's based on illegitimate distinctions. Distinctions that are not legitimate. So the Supreme Court has created uh, what they call a suspect classification. Discrimination that is based on an attribute that is, has a uh, suspect characteristic, the Supreme Court will, will look at very closely. And so what do we mean by suspect classification? A classification is suspicious or is suspect, according to the Supreme Court, if it's based on three properties. One is that the characteristic is immutable, meaning it cannot be changed. This is race, gender, and so forth. There has to be a history of discrimination against that group, and the group has to be able to, unable to affect change through public policy. Any classification that forms a basis for discrimination that has those three characteristics, the Supreme Court is going to look at very closely and in most cases not allow government to discriminate against people based on these uh, characteristics. The most common three suspect classifications are race, nationality, and gender. And the Supreme Court has created a three-tiered system in terms of how it um, 
how it scrutinizes or how much scrutiny it gives to classifications based on race, nationality, and gender. Now, the highest level of scrutiny is strict scrutiny, and the Supreme Court usually uh, reserves that for racial discrimination. There's what they call an intermediate scrutiny, so gender discrimination would receive this, and then there's a rational basis, and they apply this to the LGBT-based discriminations. So why are there different levels of uh, scrutiny for you know, different types of discrimination? It's something that would take a long time to explain and getting into the different parts of each one of these levels of scrutiny would also take a long time uh, to explain. It is an ongoing debate and it's something we're going to bypass so that we can get straight to the core of the material. Let me back up a second and talk about the Civil Rights Movement and how we're going to think about it, how we're going to uh, conceptualize it. A lot of textbooks, a lot of discussions and treatment of the Civil Rights Movement views it as sort of a linear progression, that there were court battles, there were uh, demonstrations, and it gives a sense that all these things took place simultaneously, and you have all of these events sort of squished together into one period of time. And the reality is that there were actually two separate uh, and not exactly parallel paths that the Civil Rights Movement took. The first, as you can see, is the legal path. They had to win victories in the court first, but that legal path did not guarantee uh, victory. Brown versus Board of Education, as we'll talk about, did not end segregation. So the Civil Rights Movement had to take another tactic or a different path in order to achieve actual equality. That's what we call the political path. And so the Supreme Court battles and the legal battles operated during the 40s and 50s. But after the 50s, after the Civil Rights Movement had won those battles, they had to change tactics, as we're going to talk about, and pursue a political path. And that political path is very different, and it was, um, it's a different strategy that the Civil Rights Movement used. So we're going to talk about each one of these separately, but understand that they are a little bit related. First of all, the legal path. To understand this, we have to go all the way back to the 1890s with Jim Crow laws in the South. And again, the Jim Crow laws were primarily in the South, but there were, were other parts of the country, such as... Um, Kansas, where uh, the Jim Crow laws were also in effect. So what are the Jim Crow laws? Jim Crow laws had two main purposes. The first is to disenfranchise African Americans. In the South, African Americans were a very large uh, population. In some states, as large as 35 or even 40 percent at the time. So 35, 40 percent of the population in some of these states were African Americans. If African Americans were allowed to vote, they would have voted for different policies. And so the Jim Crow laws were also, the second goal of them was to maintain the segregation of the races. Uh, segregation just simply means social separation. African Americans and whites, actually racial minorities of all types, and whites had different bathrooms, different water fountains. There were some restaurants and some neighborhoods where racial minorities were not allowed to uh, to, to go. Now keep in mind that the first is a way to ensure the second. The reason for disenfranchising African Americans for, from keeping them from voting was in order to maintain segregation. If African Americans could vote, then they would vote for politicians who would end segregation. And whites at the time did not want that, so they enacted the Jim Crow laws to maintain segregation by preventing the uh, African Americans and other racial minorities from voting. So there are a couple of mechanisms that they used to exclude African Americans and other racial minorities from the ballot. The first is what we call the white primary. The law, uh, a white primary means that only whites are allowed to vote in the primary. There are two elections that we have in America. The first is to choose the nominees for the parties. That's called the primary, and then the second election is a general election where Republican and a Democrat are on the ballot. You choose between them, and whoever wins that election holds the office. So the primary was in the South was used to maintain white dominance. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that the South was a one-party system. After the Civil, this was after the Civil War. The Democratic Party was dominant in the South. They were 
in most places the only party that could actually win elected office in those southern states. And by only allowing white people to vote in the primary, they guaranteed that the only people who would represent the Democratic Party as their nominee would be those who favored segregation. So hopefully, again, you can see how this is a way to maintain segregation. The second mechanism that was used to exclude African Americans from the polls was what we call a poll tax. Poll tax, you basically have to pay money to vote. Um, because of segregation, African Americans were very poor at the time and other racial minorities. They were not allowed to hold jobs or, or hold the better jobs. They were not allowed to go to the best schools. They were most, in most cases, colleges were segregated, so they were not allowed to go to the same colleges. And so they did not have the same economic opportunities. And most of the racial minorities at the time who were uh, discriminated against didn't have the money to pay for it. And then the third mechanism is a literacy test. Now, this sounds innocuous enough. It sounds like you, know, you show up and they make sure that you can read so that you can read the ballot. And if you can't read, then you're not allowed to vote. In reality, a literacy test was, um, was a very insidious mechanism. What it did, what, what oftentimes would happen is uh, an African-American or other minority would show up at the polls having paid the poll tax and they were given this test. Somebody would pull out a very arcane and obscure section of the Constitution and demand that they be able to explain that. This is actually a test that most people even today would not be able to pass. Um, and it was administered differently. It was administered in a very uh, discriminatory way. What that meant is that when a white person showed at the poll, they were rarely given the literacy test. It was only when a racial minority would show up to vote that they were then given the test. And overwhelmingly, you know, again, most people even today would not be able to pass such a test. It was certainly true of most uh, racial minorities at the time. The tests were, again, it's hard to overstate just how arcane and obscure the information that was on this was. Now, the last two mechanisms, the poll tax and the literacy test, they did affect poor and illiterate whites. However, the Jim Crow laws also had a, another mechanism called the grandfather clause. Basically means that if your grandfather could vote, then you could vote, and you were exempt from the poll tax and the literacy test. Now, again, remember the time. This is the 1890s. It was only about two or three decades after the Civil War, which meant that racial minorities, especially African Americans, their grandparents were not allowed to vote. No, none of the grandparents of the people living at that time could vote. The only people who had grandparents that were allowed to vote were whites. And so, again, the obvious effect of the grandfather clause was to exempt white people from the poll tax and the literacy te uh, tests. So, taken together, the Jim Crow laws represented a powerful obstacle that kept African Americans from voting in the states that had enacted them. And again, the goal of these Jim Crow laws ultimately was to maintain segregation. They did it by preventing African Americans from voting. Moreover, these Jim Crow laws actually had Supreme Court support behind it. Um, several people challenged these laws to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually upheld them, said that they were constitutional. The famous case is Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. It's a case that involved Homer Plessy, Homer Plessy who was seven-eighths white. Um, so even though somebody was predominantly white, they still were affected by these laws. It had to do um, with what they called the one-drop rule, that anybody that had one drop of minority blood in them was considered a minority. Um, so Homer Plessy, being seven-eighths white, was still subject to these Jim Crow laws, and he was convicted of sitting in a whites-only railroad car in Louisiana. There were white sections and uh, colored, what they call colored sections at the time, uh, these two sections in the railroad cars, African Americans could not sit in the whites only uh, cars. So there was segregation even in public transportation. Homer Plessy went and sat in the whites only railroad car, arrested, convicted of uh, violating the law, and took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. 
and the Supreme Court upheld it. What they said is that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment only refers to political equality. In other words, voting. So as long as laws allow everybody to vote, then laws that reflect this, what, again, I'm, this is obviously a very racist uh, opinion by the Supreme Court. I'm simply articulating their argument. What they said is that laws that reflect the social inferiority of African Americans um, are actually allowed, that only political equality must be respected. Now, when we use the term racist, this is a classic definition of racism. The idea behind separate railroad cars or separate areas is that whites are, as a race, are inferior to African Americans. The Supreme Court, with this ruling, actually affirmed that idea, um, that very racist idea that the uh, that, that whites are superior to African Americans in the social setting. You may have heard this referred to as a separate but equal doctrine. The idea behind this is that the facilities have to be separate and yet relatively equal. The separation is a result of the, at the time, believed social inferiority of African Americans and other racial minorities. And yet there was, the Supreme Court did say, as long as the, uh, the railroad cars were approximately equal, then the, then the segregation was uh, allowed by the Constitution. Again, the main point and what's going to be important about the Civil Rights Movement strategy in overcoming these Jim Crow laws is this notion of political equality and the distinction between political equality and social equality that we talked about before. That distinction was actually a strong basis behind the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. It was not until the 1940s and the 1950s that African Americans began to gain significant legal advances in the courts. They began to challenge a lot of these laws in the courts and they used a very, a very strategic approach to it. Now, the NAACP, if you don't know, is a prominent civil rights organization. It's still very uh, powerful and very active today. At the time, they developed a legal strategy that has become the basis for a lot of other civil rights movements that have followed it. And I think it's important to talk about that strategy and why it was so successful. The legal strategy that they used had two different steps. The first step was to achieve political equality. Remember, Plessy versus Ferguson did say that political equality was required under the law. It was social equality that the states did not have to guarantee. You don't need to know the case, but here's an example of this. In 1944, the Supreme Court ruled in a case uh, called Smith v. Allwright that the white primary was discriminatory. It did infringe upon racial minorities' opportunity to vote, and they ruled it unconstitutional. So in 1944, the white primary was thrown out, and over the course of several years, the other mechanisms behind the Jim Crow laws were also ruled unconstitutional by the courts. So the NAACP's legal strategy, first of all, went after and tried to guarantee political equality, and second, and only after they had made the point about political equality, then they go after social equality. Another example, again, you do not need to know this Supreme Court case, um, is Sweat v. Painter in 1950. It involved the University of Texas All-Black Law School, and what the students at the law school were able to show is that the facilities for the All-Black Law School were not equal to the White Law School. There were fewer professors, the library was not as well stocked with books, and the facilities were just, they were not equal. And so they took the case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed with them. Yet, even though the Supreme Court uh, threw out the all-black law school and ruled that that was not equal, that case only applied to the University of Texas law school. It was not a national sweeping decision. It was a very narrow decision. What that meant is that the Supreme Court, even in the 1950s, was still operating under the uh, Plessy versus Ferguson ruling and the notion of equal, uh, separate but equal. They just simply happened to say that the University of Texas Law School was not equal in, the sep in being separate. It was not until 1954 before the NAACP went full square after Plessy versus Ferguson. With this case, 
they tried to get the Supreme Court to overturn Plessy and rule that separate but equal was actually unconstitutional. And they did this by making a class action lawsuit. Class action simply means that it represents all citizens. There's a large group of citizens who are affected by the government policy, and the case was brought on behalf of all of those, uh, all of those people. In this case, it was brought on behalf of all students in public schools. What that meant is that the court ruling was going to have very broad consequences. Brown versus Board of Education was not directed at a particular school. It was not directed at a particular high school or college or elementary school. It was brought on behalf of all of the public schools in America at the time. Now, I should also note that there are actually two different Brown versus Board of Education decisions. I've combined them into one. I think that you know, if this were a, a constitutional law class, then separating them and talking about the different points in each one makes sense. Just keep in mind, I squished both the decisions together. And so when we talk about this, you know, we talk about it as though it was one decision. It was actually a series of decisions. And in fact, the Supreme Court with Brown versus Education eliminated the separate but equal doctrine. And they ruled that schools must desegregate, quote, with all deliberate speed. Now, the case was limited only to public schools across America, but nonetheless, it was still a very broad ruling. It ruled that, equal, that separate but equal doctrine was unconstitutional and said that segregation in the school system must end. In other areas, the court did not address because, again, this was a case brought only regarding, only on behalf of students, and the Supreme Court very rarely will go outside the scope of a decision. If a uh, case involves public school systems, they're rarely going to apply the decision in that case to public accommodations, restaurants, and so forth. So again, it's important to understand that as broad as this ruling was, it still only applied to public schools. Despite all of these legal victories, they did not end discrimination. The Civil Rights Movement achieved a lot of victories during this time, but segregation was still a reality. In 1962, several years after the Brown versus Board of Education that had eliminated segregation in public schools, only about half a percent of African American students attended a desegregated school. Why was that? Frankly put, the southern states stalled. They dragged their feet. Remember the language about all deliberate speed. What does that mean? In this case, the Supreme Court had ordered the desegregation of schools, but had used language that was very ambiguous. They did not specify within a year or two years or even three years. They just said with all deliberate speed, and they assumed that the schools would adjust on their, you know, would adjust quickly enough to desegregate the schools, to integrate the schools. In reality, though, the southern states just dragged their feet. They refused to do it. They said that they, you know, didn't have enough time, they made other excuses, and they simply refused to integrate the schools. What that meant is that the states were going to have to be forced to comply with the Supreme Court order. Now, as we'll talk about when we, talk, when we get to the Supreme Court as an institution, the Supreme Court has very limited ability to actually enforce its decision. It can rule law unconstitutional, as they did with segregation, but they do not have their own police force or military to compel public officials and politicians to comply. So there are, there are going to have to be other mechanisms that force the states to comply because the Supreme Court could not, uh, did not have the power to force the states to integrate the schools. So what would that require? It was going to require national involvement. The public as a nation was going to have to become concerned enough about this issue to put pressure on politicians to do something about it. And there's going to have to be political change through the elections. Politicians tend to care about re-election and anything that threatens their political office, anything that threatens them in the next election, they're going to take very seriously. And so this is one of the lessons about the Civil Rights Movement, which is that you cannot simply win a Supreme Court or a legal victory and assume that everybody is going to uh, obey that decision and act altruistically to in the aftermath of it. Sometimes uh, an issue is so divisive that one side, despite losing legal victory, will simply refuse to comply with the Supreme Court. And when you're talking about government as 
the actor that is enforce that is doing the thing that's ruled unconstitutional, the Supreme Court is very limited in how it can enforce that. So all of this set the stage for the political battles in the 1960s, which is what we're going to talk about now. But I want you to understand that the legal this is why the legal victories were not enough. That yes, the Supreme Court had ruled that segregation was unconstitutional, but again, the states simply refused to obey that uh, command or that order from the Supreme Court, and therefore, the civil rights movement, having won those legal victories, were going to have to pursue a political path and a political strategy in order to get segregation ended in reality. So in the 1960s, this marked a strategic shift by the NAACP and the other parts of the civil rights movement towards nonviolent protests. The Supreme Court had already ruled that segregation was unconstitutional, and so in the nonviolent protests, what they called civil disobedience, they would pursue a strategy of peacefully walking into a restaurant, a whites-only restaurant, and sitting at the counter and demanding to be served. And they realized that this was going to be controversial. They realized that the reaction in many cases would be violent. But nonetheless, the nonviolent protest strategy they felt was the best way to achieve it. Now, I should point out, this was not a universal uh, decision that this was, there was actually debate about whether to have armed protests or riots, and there were indeed some violence and some riots by those who protested segregation. But as a whole, the civil rights movement coalesced around the idea of nonviolent protest as the best strategy for achieving the political uh, path and the political gains that they needed to achieve. Hopefully everybody under, uh, remembers from high school and middle school history that they rallied around a major leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He, had, he was the one that coordinated the Montgomery bus boycott. Montgomery is a city in Alabama. And um, he encouraged African Americans as a way to protest the segregated areas on the buses to boycott the buses, to not use the buses, and to show the city how much revenue African Americans provided to the public transportation system. Without that money, the revenue from the public transportation, the buses, would hurt the companies and hurt the government. And so they wanted to put that pressure on them, again, with a nonviolent peaceful protest. They created the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and they got a lot of resources from churches and other clergy. Remember that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was also a reverend. Why was this important? Because churches have a lot of experience organizing. And any type of protest, any type of political strategy is going to require a lot of organization and a lot of skills at getting a lot of people together for the same purpose, for either a march or a boycott, how much organization something like that is going to require. Coordinating large groups of people for a common purpose is something that these churches had a lot of experience doing. And finally, having won legal victories for voting rights, having gotten access to the ballots, the civil rights movement was going to start using that political power in order to change policies. Now, again, the major point of all this, hopefully you remember a lot of this from uh, your history classes in high school or middle school, the main part here is the nonviolent protest as a strategic shift, and more importantly, the strategic shift from a legal a legal strategy in the courts to a political strategy. So let's fast forward to the 1963 Birmingham demonstration. There were a lot of demonstrations, there were a lot of marches, there were a lot of protests. I chose the 1963 Birmingham de demonstration to illustrate the strategy behind the civil rights movement. Birmingham was not chosen randomly. As a city, there were a lot of cities in the South where people could have protested. They chose it, though, because the police commissioner, a man by the name of Eugene Bull Connor, was a notorious racist and a bigot. I'll illustrate in a few minutes uh, exactly how bad this guy was, but this was a bad dude. This was not a good person. What that meant is that the civil rights movement and the protesters knew that the city response was going to be a violent crackdown, that the police were going to show up, that they were going to beat people up, they were going to react very violently. And the civil rights movement 
having understood that and expecting that response, had the media there to film everything and to take pictures and to report on in the newspaper. In the media, there's a common you know, refrain, if it bleeds, it leads. The media oftentimes cannot avoid uh, covering a large, dramatic, and especially violent clash, especially between peaceful protesters and the police. And indeed, the civil rights movement was correct in their strategy, and there were peaceful protesters who were attacked by the police, including small children and women who were beaten and attacked by the police. Here are a couple of images to illustrate this. This is uh, a family that's getting hit by a water hose. Now, the use of water hoses is somewhat misunderstood today. People think it was just you know, to make them wet and uncomfortable, and that's not true. These were high-pressure water hoses, and they could strip the skin off somebody. It was very painful to get hit by one of these things, and in fact, in some cases, it could actually cause uh, injury to internal organs. That's how powerful they were. And so there are videos of people who were uh, hit by these water hoses literally being pushed down the street by the pressure of it. Here's another picture, police officers using um, German shepherds and police dogs to attack the protesters. Now, to give you an idea of just how bad Bull Connor was, the police commissioner, he saw this photograph the, a couple of days later in the newspaper, and he got very angry about it. And his response is very telling. What he said was, why'd you use that dog? Why didn't you get the mean one? So we're not talking about a good man here. And again, the Birmingham demonstration, Birmingham, Alabama, was chosen primarily because Bull Connor was such a notorious racist and a bigot that the protesters knew that the city was going to crack down on them. And the images like you're seeing here were actually going to make it into the news. And the idea was to try to rally public support nationally for the movement. Now we're going to take a brief interlude and watch a video. It's only about three, four minutes long, but it also will give you a very, very good sense of how violent the police uh, and, the and other people's reactions were to these protests. Uh, where it's about the civil rights movement today. You're going to get to see some of the people who protested, and I want you to pay particular attention to Representative John Lewis, who, as the video shows, was attacked in a whites-only waiting area at a bus terminal. That, towards the end of the lecture, is going to become very important. So pay attention to that part especially, but also look at, you know, this will give, the video will give you a good sense of the violence that occurs. A lot of people have a misunderstanding about these protests that people just marched down the street and maybe they were sprayed with water hoses and yelled at and mean things were said about them. But in fact, uh, in fact, the, the situation at the time was often very violent. People got, beaten, uh, got beat up. And there are actually civil rights leaders today who were beaten so badly by the police that they incurred brain damage, uh, permanent brain damage. The protests and the demonstrations at the time were very tumultuous. They were very violent and oftentimes very dangerous for the people who were struggling to overturn segregation. These original Freedom Riders are getting off a bus in Washington for an event to honor them. They are among the more than 400 people who joined the 1961 Freedom Rides in the American South. Joan Mulholland remembers the white segregation as saying, You are a traitor to the race and a disgrace. Mulholland was a college student when she was arrested during the riot for illegally crossing racial lines. Another was John Lewis, now a U.S. congressman. He and his white seatmate were assaulted as they entered a whites-only waiting room in a South Carolina bus terminal. We were attacked by a group of young white men and beaten and left lying in a pool of blood. The local police officials arrived and wanted to know whether we wanted to press charges, and we said no. So we come in peace, with love and nonviolence. Often, it was a white writer who was attacked first. Jim's Ware ended up in the hospital. They were to crack and fell forward, 
uh, rolled over on my back and a foot came down in my face and that was it, I was out. We're willing to accept death. But we're going to keep coming until we can ride from anywhere in the south. Some buses had police or military on board, but they often did nothing when the people getting off the buses were attacked. This Freedom Rider bus went up in flames in Alabama after a firebomb was thrown through a window. Hank Thomas remembers the terror he felt. As it, the bus was burning, we all had a decision to make, and that was, do you still try to get off the bus and go into the mob where you were certainly going to be beaten to death? As the riders escaped from the bus, they were viciously beaten, but no one died. Despite calls by government officials for the freedom rights to stop, Diane Nash, a student civil rights leader, says the movement was not giving up. It was clear to me that if we allowed the freedom ride to stop at that point, just after so much violence had been inflicted, the message would have been sent that all you have to do to stop a nonviolent campaign is inflict massive violence. As the rides continued, more activists were jailed for violating segregation laws, especially in Mississippi. Some were crowded into small cells and got no exercise. Bernard Lafayette Jr. says when the prisoners refused to stop singing freedom songs, mattresses, sheets, and toothbrushes were taken away. Buses are a common. Buses are a coming, buses are a coming, oh yes. Civil rights leader C.T. Vivian rode on the bus and says the Freedom Riders brought hope to blacks in rural areas of the South who later formed the backbone of the civil rights movement. Their hopes were on us, you know, and we were supposed to, in fact, do what we're doing and to make it so that one day their children wouldn't have to put up with what they put up with. The efforts of the Freedom Riders paid off. At the end of 1961, the U.S. government banned segregation at interstate travel facilities and on interstate buses and trains. Deborah Block, VOA News, Washington. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea about the turmoil and the violence that was going on at the time. In fact, after a series of several of these protests, the brutality actually did lead to a public outcry. The strategy worked. <clears throat> Shortly after the Birmingham demonstration, President Kennedy gave a TV appearance and he talked about discrimination as a moral issue. It was the first time that politicians, especially national politicians, had come out and talked about discrimination in that way. And so his television appearance was not simply to promote uh, the end of segregation, but he talked about it in moral terms, which changed the national debate. He also proposed new civil rights legislation, and shortly after, he was assassinated. All of this led up to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Now, in the Senate, the Southern Democrats actually filibustered the Civil Rights Act. What that means is that in the Senate, there's a mechanism called the filibuster, where any senator is allowed to talk for as long as he or she wants. And so the Southern Democrats got together in the Senate and they held up the legislation. There's a famous filibuster that lasted somewhere between 10 to 12 hours. One person stood on the floor of the Senate and talked. Until the filibuster ends, the legislation cannot even receive a vote. So the Senate could not even vote on the Civil Rights Act until the filibuster ended. President Johnson, who replaced President Kennedy, broke the filibuster and importantly, was able to get the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. He was a, President Johnson was a former senator, had strong relations in the Senate, and was also very influential. And so having broken the filibuster, they passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and the act ended racial and gender discrimination. Actually went a little farther than the legal victories had. And also importantly, it ended discrimination in the schools, the workplace, and public ac accommodations. Public accommodations are simply any business that is open to serve the public, restaurants, and so forth. Now, it's important that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was actually stronger and went farther than Kennedy's proposed legislation itself. So having passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 
they went into the 1964 elections where civil rights became a focal point. <clears throat> the Republican Party, GOP stands for Grand Old Party, it's a common acronym used for the Republicans. The Republicans nominated Barry Goldwater, who had opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And the Democrats nominated President Johnson, who had supported and helped it pass. In fact, Johnson had argued that the 1964 Civil Rights Act should be passed as President Kennedy's legacy. And so he had rallied the country behind the act. Barry Goldwater had opposed it, which meant that the two political parties, for the first time, had presented a, a clear choice on the issues and that citizens could vote between the parties based on that issue of civil rights. Before then, the southern wing of the Democratic Party had been pro-segregation and the senators and representatives in the Democratic Party from other parts of the country had been anti-segregation. So there's a split between within the Democratic Party, which is one of the reasons that Democrats nationally refused to act on civil rights. It was not until the aftermath of the Birmingham demonstrations and Kennedy's appearance that the Democratic Party took a clear stand in favor of civil, civil rights. And the 1964 elections were the first time that voters got a chance to choose between the parties on that. The Democrats won big. 95% of African Americans voted Democrat. They had leaned towards the Democratic Party before then for reasons we'll talk about when we talk about the party systems. But after the 1964 elections, 95% of African Americans voted Democrat and have voted that way ever since. Even today, 90 to 95% of African Americans tend to vote for the Democratic candidate for President, Senate, House of Representatives, and to a lesser extent for local leaders as well. So if you want to understand why African Americans are such a large part of the Democratic coalition, it started here. It started with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The 1964 elections was one of the biggest wins in history. It was a, such a one-sided electoral butt-kicking that it gave the Democratic Party a mandate to end segregation. They would, they would do this by sending National Guard into the states to force schools to comply with the, with the Supreme Court Brown versus Board of Education decision. But again, look at how long it took. It took you know, nearly a decade between the Supreme Court ruling that segregation was unconstitutional to the uh, national political leaders making it a central issue in the elections and receiving an electoral mandate to end it and to actually take steps to end it in practice, not just legally. What it meant is that there is now an electoral penalty for opposing civil rights. No Republican nominee for president since 1964 has ever opposed the civil rights movement and none has ever come out in support of segregation. The 1964 elections are a pivotal turning point in the debate. Before, you did have some national politicians who supported segregation and others who opposed it. After the 1964 elections, in the one-sided butt-kicking that Republicans took after they nominated somebody who had opposed the Civil Rights Act, it changed the debate. Republican Party has uh, supported integration and opposed segregation ever since. Now, the parties still will do have differences in terms of racial policies, especially things such as affirmative action, but this election, again, is very important because it effectively ended the debate about segregation. And the other important thing that the 1964 election show us is that a political solution is often required for deeply divisive issues. What that means is that the Supreme Court ruling on an issue such as race and segregation is often not enough. As we talked about, states and local governments will often just refuse to obey the Supreme Court ruling. However, if there's a political penalty to be paid for that opposition, then it will often, that's what's required to change the national debate and to get you know, reforms and change in reality. So again, the 1964 election really highlights the need for the civil rights movement to have pursued a political path to ending segregation and not simply stop after they won in the Supreme Court. So let's sum up the lecture on civil rights. Basically, the lawsuits and the legal path only went so far. 
we talked about federalism, and the nature of federalism means that it's very hard for the Supreme Court to implement or enforce its rulings. The federal government and federal politicians often need an electoral incentive to intervene, and in this case, they needed a public outcry in reaction to the demonstrations and the public or the police crackdown on those demonstrations in order to incentivize them to take action. The demonstrations, as we talked about, created the public demand for the federal action, and the 1964 elections created that electoral penalty. That prompted the federal government to finally get involved in in segregation in practice. Afterwards, again, both parties supported ending segregation, and that debate was effectively ended once it was very clear that any politician that supported segregation would be thrown out of office. And that became uh, 10 years after the 1964 elections. It had an effect not just in changing the policy at the federal level, but also changing the debate and the policy positions of politicians down to the local levels. So that's, just to wrap it up, that's, I think, the major story behind the Civil Rights Movement is that it was very strategic, it was a very smart strategy that they pursued, and it was a long, hard-fought victory. It was not something that happened quickly. It was not something that happened just because a few people went out on the streets and you know marched through the city to oppose these policies. It took a lot of time to change the nature of the Supreme Court rulings from Plessy versus Ferguson to the Brown versus Board of Education. It was very strategically targeted at those mechanisms in the Jim Crow laws that <clears throat> kept African Americans from voting. Once those laws were overturned by the Supreme Court and African Americans began to be able to actually vote and express their political power that they had gained, they were able to shift to a political strategy to pressure politicians via public demands and public outcry following the violence surrounding the demonstrations and to finally create a situation where the two parties presented a clear view on the issue of segregation in the Civil Rights Act that allowed the public to settle the issue once and for all. So, Again, following the 1964 elections, they were very pivotal in changing the debate and shifting the national policy from areas where segregation was supported and existed to actually ending segregation in practice. And again, this is a strategy that's been pursued by many different civil rights movements, including LGBT, women's suffrage, women's rights, and so forth. Now, even though the 1964 elections effectively ended the debate over segregation, and in the years that would come, segregation would be eliminated from public schools and other public accommodations, I don't want to suggest that, in terms of race, that we have solved all the problems. I don't want to leave with the impression that there are no more, that there is no more progress that we can make, or that there are not continuing debates. There is and there are. Um, however, I think that the Civil Rights Movement does, in this lecture, I hope, shows you that there have been some major successes. And to give you a sense of how far we have come in terms of racial race relations and racial issues in this country, I want to leave you with a video that highlights uh, Representative John Lewis. Remember, he was the one that was attacked uh, in a whites-only waiting area in a bus terminal. And this video is about him and a very unlikely meeting that occurred between him and somebody else. So I'll leave, leave you with the video and we'll see you next time. An unlikely reunion for these two men, Congressman John Lewis and Elwin Wilson. They didn't even know the other's identity. They met, if you can call it that, 48 years ago. In very different times, in a blur of angry fists and proud protest. Lewis, then a freedom rider for Dr. King, arrived at the Rock Hill, South Carolina bus depot, May 9, 1961, and was pummeled by Wilson, who for years has been working his way toward this moment. I'm sorry for what happened down there. Well, it's okay. It's all right. It's almost 48 years ago. That's right. Yeah. So remember that day well? <laughs> I try to get it out of my mind. Mm -hmm.
Did you ever imagine this moment? I, I never thought that uh, this would happen. It says something about the power of love, the power of grace, and the power of people to be able uh, to say, I'm sorry. I feel like I got saved out there. Going back those 48 years, not easy for either of them. We uh, tried to enter a so-called white waiting room, and the moment we started through the door, a group of young men attacked us. You helped beat up Representative Lewis. Help. I didn't have no help. It was you. It was yeah. all you. Yeah. There were so many incidents he now recounts with shame. I had a black baby doll in the house. And I had a little rope, and I tied it to a limb and uh, let it hang there. You can see the glee on his face after he hit this man with an egg, fighting to keep blacks out of the local diner. Over the years, he'd revisit the diner, haunted, knowing he'd done wrong. One of his buddies, deeply religious, posed the question that would finally set his soul on a different course. He said, if you died right now, do you know where you would go? I said, to hell. And then, as Elwin Wilson watched Barack Obama become president, something shifted in his heart. Now, I didn't vote for him, but I'm glad he's there. And I prayed for him. And so, for weeks now, Wilson has been apologizing all around town and then in Washington. The sudden transformation overwhelming to Wilson's son, Christopher. He was really a hard person to deal with growing up. I always tell you that, you know, we're all the same. And what now? I want to love people, regardless of what color. A five-decade journey from the evil of bigotry to the power of redemption. We gather because we have chosen hope. That as much as any other change in our country, clearly answers the hopes of Dr. King and his followers. For you to come here today, and it's amazing. Maybe others will come forth, and because there need to be this healing. Look, it's like I said, if one person comes forward and says the same thing I did, this is all worth it. Good to see you, my friend. Okay. Good to see you.